Hey, you'd like to talk about mixing problems today? Uh, when you put two different substances together and the final temperature they arrive at, that kind of thing. I also want to talk about heat transfer, how heat, how that energy moves from, from point A to point B. So let's see what happens here. Uh, first up, we need to... Come on. There we go. Uh, here's a little mixing problem. Sorry, wrong one. Let's go right here. Uh, a mixing problem, the little picture shows it pretty well here. We're going to take a hot bar of iron and throw it into some cold water. All right. Uh, you got 200 grams of iron, 100 degrees of, uh, of temperature on the iron, 600 grams of water, 20 degrees Celsius. We'd like to find that temperature that it arrives at. So um, this really boils down to a conservation of energy problem. I am not going to get any free energy here. And I'm not going to lose any energy. It just kind of moves from the hot iron to the cold water. So the first thing that I'd like you to get to, to, uh, to do here would be to write down the sum of the heat equals zero. There is no free energy, no lost energy here. And when I add up all the heat that moves from here to there, then the net is zero. If this thing loses 800 joules, this thing gains 800 joules, and the sum of those two would be zero. Now, obviously, we're assuming that no heat escapes out the side or the top of this thing. Uh, it's all here or there, and uh, that may not be realistic in real life, but that's what we're doing. So the first thing that you want to do is to come along here and say the heat that is gained by the water plus the heat that is lost by the iron bar equals zero. And those are the two that we're talking about. This is going to be a positive number. This is going to be a negative number. Together they equal zero. Now the bar, I'm sorry, the water here, let's start with that one. Uh, the water is at 20 degrees. It's going to go up in temperature. So that's going to be a sensible heat change. And I'm going to get an MC delta T right here like that. Similarly, the bar of iron is a solid metal, and it's still going to be a solid metal as it cools off. So that's another MC delta T, another sensible heat change right there, like that. Uh, the reason this one's positive is the delta T is going to go up. Temperature is going to rise in the water. This one's going to be a negative because the temperature is falling here. Now I do have two masses, the mass of the water and the mass of the bar and I've got two heat capacities and I got to keep those separate it might help to come along and call it uh, M1 and M2 and C1 C2 and Delta T1 and Delta T2 or you could call it uh, M sub W C sub W Delta T sub W M B C B Delta T B whatever works here come up with something and then maybe you want to come up here and uh, say, let's see, the water was number one. So this is uh, mass one. And here's the initial temperature. We'll call it T1. And this would be mass two and T2. Uh, whatever you got to do f f on the bookkeeping side of that thing to keep everything straight, um, do it. Okay. Uh, you would also want to watch the units very closely here. And some things matter and some don't, but you're always safe in kilograms. So I'd probably go 2 kilograms right here. and I'm sorry, 0 0.2 kilograms and 0 0.6 kilograms for mass 1 there like that. Everything else should be fine. I've got the, uh, the constants that we need down here. Uh, those, of course, would be given to you on a test or something. But, uh, you know, you got to have those and keep those straight too. So, uh, here we go. I would come along and stretch this thing out, say M1C1. This delta T is going to be the final minus the initial temperature. So final is T sub F, and we call the initial T1 like that. And this would be M2C2 T sub F uh, minus T2 like that. Okay, now we're trying to solve for TF, which is here and there. And so I've kind of got this thing scattered out. 
probably the best thing to do is to go ahead and distribute this term and distribute this term. It's going to make a big mess, but I don't know of a better way to do it. So M1C1 T sub F minus M1C1 T1. Uh, that was all the stuff outside times the first time and then times the second one. Here was a positive, there's a negative. Keep all that straight. And then we'll do the same thing over here. Take the M2C2 times this one and then times that one. M2C2 T sub F uh, minus M2 C2 T2 equals zero. Now since I'm trying to get T sub F by itself here, let's leave these two on the left hand side and we'll add those two, put them on the right, and that would be M1 C1 T sub F plus M2 C2 T sub F equals uh, M1 C1 T1, added that to both sides, added M2 C2 T2 to both sides. I'm going to factor out this common term right here. So T sub F M1 C1 plus M2 C2 equals all this mess on the right. I think you see where this is going. A little bit of algebra here. Nothing too bad. As long as you keep it straight. And then I could divide both sides by this M1C1 plus M2C2. And uh, it would come over here like you see. And in the interest of space, I'm just going to uh, do that right there. Kind of do two steps. We'll cancel all this with all that. Now I've got that TF by itself right there. And we can put the numbers in and see what we got. Now again... Units are critical on all of this. So uh, let's see if we can keep this straight. I've got up top 0.2 kilograms. C1, uh, that's the water that we're talking about. So right here, 4,185. I think the uh, other thing said 46, but whatever. Joules, kilogram, degree Celsius. And um, T1 was 20 degrees. And then I need to add M2, which was 0 0.6 times 448 heat capacity of iron given down there at the bottom. And uh, its initial temperature was um, 100 degrees. Okay. And I'm dividing by uh, mass 1 is 0.2 no, it's not. I got my numbers all mixed up. See what I'm saying? You got to keep an eye on this thing. Um, this one should have been M1. So this one right here should be 0.6. And there's my 4185. And this one right over here uh, should have been 0.2. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to get a 2 in there. Uh, great. Come on now, help me out. There we go, 0.2. Good enough? Okay, and maybe we're good now. Uh, I need to multiply by the heat capacity, which was 4185 or 6 or whatever, and then 0.2, uh, this one is 0.6, times 448. All right, and if I got everything in the right place, uh, and that really is the trick to doing this right here. Uh, keep your eye on it. Maybe I did that right. Let's see what happens. I'm going to put some parentheses around the top and also around the bottom. So here's an opening parenthesis. 0.6 times 4185 times 20 plus 0.2 times 448 uh, times 100. That's my numerator. Divide by parenthesis. 0.6 times 4185 plus 0.2 times 448. And I get a 22.8. All right. I'm going to put that down right here. T sub F equals 22.8 degrees Celsius. Uh, I believe that number. Um, we put the hot bar in the water. The bar is going to cool off. So the bar went from uh, 100 
degrees Celsius to 22.8. Uh, energy always goes from hot to cold, and it did that. It went from the hot to the cold. The water, on the other hand, started at 20 degrees Celsius, and it warmed up to 22.8. They met in the middle, and um, remember that water has that really high heat capacity here. It's almost 10 times harder to heat water than it is iron. And so that's why it didn't go up very much. Uh, Water is an interesting material in, in that way. All right, so that's a mixing problem. We mix two materials. Um, I would always make this the starting point right there. It's hard to go wrong if you do that. And, um, you know, some of this you might could have uh, put numbers in and simplified it along the way or something. But uh, that certainly works. All right. Here's uh, one more of those. Uh, this time, and I didn't change the picture. I should have changed the picture. Sorry about that. Um, we're taking some ice that's at negative 10 degrees, and we're adding that to some hot water. So I've got cold ice, not this picture right here. Um, this time the water is hot, and I've got a block of ice here, which is cold. And we're throwing that in there. Okay, so this time the energy is going from hot to cold, just like always, but this time the water's hot. So I'm going to lose heat in the water, and I'm going to gain it in the ice cube. We'd like to find the final temperature there. Now there's some more stuff going on this time. So let me write out delta Q equals zero. The sum of the heat is always equal to zero. I never gain any magic heat, never lose any. Um, I have the heat that is uh, lost by the water. And I have the heat that is gained by the ice. I think I did it in the other order last time, but this is addition. It's commutative. It's okay. Um, when that water that's at 90 degrees loses energy, it's going to cool off. And uh, but it's still going to be water. It's not going to go down to ice. I don't have enough ice here to freeze the whole bucket of water. So this is going to be a sensible heat change, mc delta t, and uh, that's that's the uh, the energy lost by the water. Over here, I've got some stuff going on. This ice is starting out at negative 10 degrees. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to warm the ice up. And then I'm going to melt the ice. And then I'm going to warm up the water that used to be ice. Right? And all that better equals zero. So let me leave some room there. But uh, see how there's three things that going, going on? I've got a sensible heat change, MC delta T. I've got a latent heat change, M L sub F. And then I've got another sensible heat change, MC delta T. And together, all of that equals zero. So hopefully that makes sense. But you got to think about every step of it, kind of like we did with the calorimetry problems last time. And uh, once again, I've got lots of numbers going on. They're all different numbers. I've got my constants down here at the bottom. But I need to figure out uh, what's going on. Since we're talking about water and ice, uh, here's a, another way to do it. Maybe I want to call this the mass of the water, the heat capacity of water, the change of temperature of the water. And then over here, I've got the uh, the mass of the ice. So I'm going to put a little I. Heat capacity of ice. The change of temperature of the ice. Right here, this is the mass of the ice. And the heat of fusion right there. But as soon as I do that, it's no longer ice. Now it's water. So when I come along with this step, i got to have the specific heat of water, not ice. Here I was warming up ice, so I got to use C sub I, 2090. And over here I'm heating up water, so I got uh, 4186. And you got to keep those separate. Now the mass didn't change right there, so you may want to call that M1, MI, whatever, right there. But uh, that's, that's, you know, the trick of, of trying to keep all of this straight. Which number goes where? If you make a nice little list like that, and maybe you want to put in, you know, M water, you know, maybe you want to do it up here or something. 
this was MW, and there's T sub W, and this is MI, and over here is T sub I. All right? So, I'm sorry, I got that all the way backwards, didn't I? This is the, see, see? Just, just watch everything real closely. This is my ice starting right here. Temperature of the ice initially. This is the mass of the water and the temperature of the water. All right, let's see what happens. Uh, I'm going to try this one just putting in the numbers, and let's see what happens. Uh, the mass of the water, 600 grams. Let's go with kilograms one more time. 0.6 uh, kilograms. And the heat capacity of water is 4,186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. The temperature of the water, the change of temperature, sorry, would be uh, the final minus the initial. So I got T sub F minus T sub I. And uh, that water started out 90 degrees. Okay. So let's put some brackets around that just to... Uh, to hold on to all that mess right there and then I'm going to come over here we'll start another big bracket uh, lots of stuff going on the mass of the ice was 200 grams or 0.2 kilograms heat capacity down there at the bottom says 2,090 joules per kilogram degree Celsius and um, I'm raising the temperature of that ice I'm going to raise it from the initial temperature of negative 10 up to the melting point which is zero so right there, that's going up 10 degrees Celsius, and I can just go ahead and put that one in. All right, moving on to this second term in the uh, the gaining of, of energy there. Uh, that mass was 0.2 kilograms, and L sub F down there at the bottom, uh, in order to change solid water into liquid water, I need 335,000 joules per kilogram. And then the last thing here, I've got to heat up this water that used to be ice. I got 0.2 kilograms of it. Uh, the heat, specific heat there, 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Trying to squeeze this in, sorry. And again, the temperature is going to be final minus initial. So that'd be T sub F. And it started out, uh, what are we talking about here? This is the ice. Uh, we warmed it up right here to zero degrees. So right there, I'm going to put a, a zero and that'll finish off that one and of course everything equals zero so somewhere that ought to go in there all right so that's a mess for sure but uh, what I'm gonna do is mush some of this down um, right here I can come along and say uh, 0 0.6 times 4186 and distribute that to the T sub F so that would be 25 let's call it 2512 times T sub F. I took, multiplied those two, went times the first one. Now I need this times this times the negative 90 there. And I've already got the first two in the calculator. So if I just go times negative 90, then I've got negative uh, 226,000. Okay. And that's the first part there. Come on across. If you want some brackets, we'll put some brackets. Fine. All right. Here's some more brackets working on the uh, the heat gained by the ice at this point. I can multiply this times this times this and get just a dumb old number, uh, which will simplify everything out a little bit. So that would be 0 0.2 times 2090, heating up the ice here to the melting point, times 10. It's got to go up 10 degrees. That is 4,180 joules. Okay, so that took care of all that. Notice that the kilograms cancels, the kilograms degrees Celsius cancels. The only thing left to be the joules. Over here, this is a number. I can get a uh, value for that. And 0 0.2 times 335,000 is 67,000. Right there. So we'll put that in. And that's also in joules. And then for that last little bit there, uh, fortunately this is a zero. So I can just kind of cross that one off and not have to worry about distributing into both. Um, but uh, I will have a plus. 
all that. So let's, uh, where's my calculator? One more time. I got 0 0.2 times 4186 times T sub F, that would be 837.2. 837.2 T sub F and that's all equal to zero. Oof! Alright, so now that we have done that uh, again we want to isolate T sub F. I've got it in two places. It's here, it's over here, so I need to leave those on the left hand side. I'm gonna add this to both sides, subtract that from both sides, subtract this from both sides, all those constants will end up over here on the right. They are currently negative, positive, positive, so I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to add that much, subtract that much, and subtract that much uh, to, to clear them out on the left. 226-044 uh, minus 4180 and also minus 67,000. One more zero, please. Thank you. Uh, is 154,864 and so that's what's going to be on the right 154 uh, 864 okay meanwhile I want this guy and this guy to stick around on the left here and uh, notice that those are both positive it's positive here I'm adding it's positive so you got to keep an eye on the signs too, but uh, I want 2512 plus 837.2, and that would be 3049. Point 0.2 if you want, I don't care. T sub F equals that number. All I got to do is divide by the 3349 and I get uh, about 46.2 degrees Celsius there uh, when I do that. All right. If you can keep it all straight, if you can watch your units, if you can do that little bit of algebra there, distribute. Uh, sometimes, you know, on this one, we went ahead and put the numbers in and that saved us some, some work because some things mushed down. You decide how you want to go through that, but that's the process of it. And once again, if you can start with the sum of the heat equals zero and say well one of them's losing some energy and the other one's gaining some energy but together there's no magic energy going in or out of this thing all right um this is an interesting graph right here and it's totally out of scale but let me kind of show you what it means here this red line marks pressure in atmospheres at one so this is like everyday life here you get up in the morning and the pressure is one atmosphere and uh, water could be in a solid state as ice and if you heat it up you got temperature on the bottom here as the temperature rises it will transition from ice into water it will melt right there this would be the melting point and so I go from solid to liquid and then finally over here to gas when I boil the thing that's what we're used to that happens all the time and I just kind of wanted to show you this graph just to kind of let you know that things get a little bit funny here at super low pressures if I crank the pressure down if I suck all the air out of the room and get down to six thousandths of an ATM uh, pretty pretty close to, to vacuum here there's a thing called the triple point where actually you can have solid liquid and gas all at the same time you could have uh, a beaker that had um, ice and water and water vapor steam all in there mixed up together and they'd all be perfectly happy you got to do it at a very low pressure and you're pretty close to the freezing point so it's not something that you're going to see in everyday life but you could you could do this in a lab sucking the air out of a, a bell jar something like that if you go down lower pressure you actually skip the liquid phase altogether you can go straight from ice to steam right there that's a process called sublimation where it just jumps over the liquid state and different materials do this uh, I don't know what they have in the bowl here but my guess is that they have dry ice 
Uh, dry ice is a really interesting thing that you can buy at uh, Kroger's has it, for example. Big cooler right up by the door. And you could buy a block of dry ice, which is frozen solid carbon dioxide, and you could put it on the counter, and that solid carbon dioxide would turn into gas carbon dioxide and float off, float away. It's good for keeping stuff cold, all right? It sublimates. From here, it jumps the liquid stage altogether. Um, if you uh, all of a sudden put a whole bunch of energy into ice, you could also get it to jump, you know, jumping over that water phase. But down here, uh, there is no water phase, no liquid phase in there. All right. Uh, deposition is going the other way. Sometimes if it's really, really cold outside and you have a single pane window, you've got that moisture in the air. And so essentially that moisture that you breathe out at night is in the air uh, as water vapor. And it's going to fast freeze, quick freeze onto the window pane as ice. And you get these patterns almost like a fern or something, some kind of fractal pattern there. And it skips the liquid, doesn't condense into water and then freeze. That would just be like a sheet of ice, but this deposition goes pop and just jumps over there. And of course, down here at super low pressure, it would do that as well, too. If you look at this scale, I mean, look at it here. Here's 0.006 and 1 and 218 ATM, right? So really weird scale here, zero, a hundredth of a degree, 100 degrees, 374. Really weird scale here. So they've kind of stretched this thing to make, to zoom in on that point right there. Uh, this is what it would look like on a on a regular axis of pressure versus temperature here. So um, just understand that that point exists. I don't really need you to do anything with it or on a test even, you know, whatever. But it's just kind of an interesting little thing that happens right there. All right. I want to talk to you about heat transfers, how heat transfers. Uh, I've got three three processes here that we need to talk about. And I'll try to make this quick. Uh, the first one is called conduction. Uh, heat conducts through a material. This is a solid, and the molecules bonking against each other transfer energy to the next one. So you've got the hot stove. Uh, that makes the bottom of the pot hot. That solid comes over here, and that heat vibrates through this thing and eventually burns your hand, right? The heat conducts from down here all the way to your hand. Now, the second method is called convection. Here, the liquid in the pot has a convection pattern where the uh, the fluid is here and it gets hot. Now it expands due to thermal expansion. Uh, that means that it's less dense, so it rises and cooler water is going to rush in from under, you know, to, to fill that. And so you get this kind of circular pattern in here. You can watch this in your in a pot of water boiling on the stove and that's that's called convection when you have a fluid be it liquid or gas that's moving and carrying that heat then that's a convection pattern if you have a convection oven it's that same kind of thing you're putting heat into it and the uh sometimes there's a fan that blows it so that's not really the convection process all by itself you got a fan that's kind of moving it but uh, that's supposed to be more efficient and uh, certainly let some charge some more money for the oven okay uh, third one here is called radiation radiation is energy moving through space specifically electromagnetic radiation so the light uh, comes off of this thing that carries energy which can go into heat so notice that the pot's not actually touching the the stove eye here that that uh, radiation is is coming up here and warming it and conducting and causing convection all three of these in the same picture here but uh, here's a formula that shows you how to calculate how fast heat conducts from one material to another remember that heat always goes from hot to cold so uh, if I've got a fire and an iron bar into some ice cream here then heat is going to travel down the length of that bar into the ice cream and eventually melt the ice cream and this little formula right here tells you how fast that heat's going to move from here to there. Um, you could kind of go through, and this is a nice one to kind of think through. I don't know that we've done one of these this semester, but thinking about why things are on the top or the bottom, whatever, um, the length of that bar makes a big difference, right? If this is two meters of iron, then 
the heat's got a long way to go before it gets to the to the ice cream so that's going to slow it down d down here the the thickness the the link the distance between uh, the hot and the cold is on the bottom because as the bottom as as that distance gets bigger then the heat rate the heat flow rate goes down all right right here a is the cross sectional area of this thing if you had a bigger bar a, a wider a thicker bar then that would carry more heat it'd be a bigger conduit for that heat to travel down all right uh, delta t is important if i have a big temperature difference between the hot and the cold that's going to travel faster because energy likes to go from hot to cold and you make a bigger temperature differential it's going to make a bigger uh, flow rate all right q here is the heat t is the time so how fast does heat flow it's up to this formula k is a uh, what we call the thermal conductivity it's a number that says here's how good that material conducts heat and we've already seen thermal expansion has a has a constant that says well glass and concrete and aluminum all expand differently this is a similar number that says those materials all carry heat better uh, or worse uh, i've got a table here uh, right here and you can see uh, here's some some representative values air wood water glass iron uh, silver down here at the bottom has a high thermal uh, conductivity this k number is the conductivity ignore that thermal resistance for a second but uh, 427 that would be in watts per meter degree celsius uh, copper doesn't conduct heat as good as silver does but it's really good aluminum not so good your aluminum pans they don't they don't heat very well uh, your grandma's copper bottom revere wear uh, is a whole lot better uh, doing that iron uh, not so good glass no water air air is a terrible heat conductor of heat okay and uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit but you could get those numbers and you could put them in right here and and uh, see what happens I got an example for you, you ready um, right here is a window is a perfectly good example and uh, if we take this window right here now first of all they made this picture using an infrared camera so um, they're looking at the infrared infrared is heat of course and you can see how it's red here and green there I'm getting a lot of heat out of this window and that's bad because I'm trying to keep the inside warm and the outside cold or vice versa in the summertime I want to keep the inside cold and the outside you know leave the hot air outside so if you take a picture with the thermal camera and you see this you are losing a lot of heat through these windows through the door and it's in your best interest to go buy yourself some better windows and keep the heat inside or outside whichever season it is let's see what kind of number we get here uh, they're saying that that piece of glass is 1.2 meters we'll say this way and 2.3 meters that way it's got a thickness of 0 0.003 meters and it's uh, 20 degrees outside and cold 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 negative four degrees outside so i take my little formula here and say how fast is heat going to flow through that window and there's no big deal here you just put the numbers in uh, you do need to watch the units and the thing i would encourage you to do is to watch the k right here now this is glass so i need the uh i need the number for glass so let's go find that table right there and glass is 0 0.8 watts per meter degree celsius 0 0.8 but almost as importantly watts per meter degree celsius see how the degree celsius there that's the temp that's the unit that i need my temperature in not kelvin if it said kelvin then i'd probably want to go that way although this is a, a temperature difference so you know 20 degrees difference in celsius is also 20 degrees difference in kelvin but uh just kind of watch the unit meters i need my distances in meters well that's fine that's what they are so i think we're good to go here but uh, keep it keep an eye on those units 0 0.8 watts per meter degree celsius uh, the area is going to be the length times the width so that'd be 1.2 meters times 2.3 meters 
and if it's 20 degrees inside and 4 degrees negative 4 outside that's a difference of 24 degrees Celsius right there and D the thickness of the glass is 0 0.003 meters now before we punch this up let's just make sure that our units are all happy and uh, we can do that right here uh, if it'll let me do it I have a meter Mm. It ain't going to do it. That meter is going to cancel this meter down here. There we go. And um, then I left off the unit right here. That's my fault. Should be a meter right there. And I can't get it in there. But there it is. Um, you know what? I, I goofed up here. It doesn't cancel that one at all. Let's let this one cancel this one right there that's on the bottom of the numerator this is on the top of the numerator I got this one right here which is in the numerator there's one in the denominator those are going to cancel I got a degree Celsius right there which is going to kill 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 uh, the one over here <laughs> and uh, there it goes and the only thing I have left is watts Okay, so this is looking pretty good. Uh, calculator come forth right here. I have uh, 0.8 times 1.2 times 2.3 times 24, and that's all divided by 0 0.003. And I got 17,664 watts. 17,664 watts. Uh, you probably remember that a watt is a joule per second. I'm losing 17,664 joules every second through that thing. Uh, you know, watts also measures light bulbs, and light bulbs cost money to run. If I take 17,664 light bulbs and uh, they're 60 watts each that's almost 300 light bulbs that you have on in your house you know just that you're paying for here uh, you could find out how much and that's just one window it's a pretty big window right 1.2 times 3.3 mirrors but uh, that is that's a lot of energy and it's going to cost you a lot of money in the winter time to heat the inside of your house and it's going to cost you a lot of money in the summertime to keep it cool so that's not good. If you look over here in this picture, you can see they've made a major difference here. I don't have that red window anymore. I don't have a lot of heat coming out of that thing. And so the question is, well, what can I do about this? And the answer is very simple. You can have a double pane window. Um, remember how I told you that the... Um, please change. There you go. That uh, air was a really poor conductor of heat okay and the glass is a whole lot better well in this case we don't want it to be a good conductor we want something that's going to hold that heat in and not conduct it so air is a much better choice than glass is uh, if you take the uh, 0.8 divided by 0 0.026. Um, air is about 31 times better. So this this would be good, right? Now there's a little formula up here called the thermal resistance formula, and essentially if you take the thickness of the material and divide by the thermal conductivity, then you get this number called the R value. If you go down to Lowe's, all of the insulation, all the foam. All the stuff that's intended to keep heat in your house is going to have an R value. The windows, the doors, and there are certain codes, that uh, building codes, that say, well, here in the south you need this much R value. And in the northeast you need more R value because it's colder. And, you you know, um, there, there's a, a way that we have to build things in order to, to make them financially responsible, uh, energy responsible to do this. So this... Take the thickness and divide by the thermal conductivity, you get that number. 
the number in lows are going to be totally different because they're using degrees Fahrenheit and feet or inches and and uh, you know they're using imperial units so they're, they're different numbers but uh, you could come along and find the R value of that glass right there uh, we said I don't even remember what the number was now all of a sudden it's jammed up I won't go back there it is um, 0 0.003 meters was my uh, thickness 0 0.003 and I'm dividing by the thermal conductivity 0.8 right here and again these are different uh, units than you would see in Lowe's but that's a 0 0.00375 okay uh, which is no good All right, that's a really low uh, value of thermal resistance R, okay, even in these units. So uh, here's what we do. We're going to take two pieces of glass, like you see here in the picture, and put them side by side with an air gap in the middle. And my R value then is going to be the R value of the first piece of glass, plus the R value of the air, plus the R value of the second piece of glass. And that air in there is a pretty good insulator. So this is a whole lot better. Um, let me go get that. Uh, we just calculated the glass there, 0 0.00375. So I'm going to put that in for this guy, 0 0.00375. And over here, And then we'll have to, and remember that was uh, this thickness of glass. Um, we'll need to calculate the R value for the air gap. It says that my thickness is 0 0.05. And when we go to the K table, it says that air has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.026. And I'll leave the units out here, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, when I do 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.026, that is a 1.9. See how much better that is than 0 0.0375? When I take uh, this number plus 1.9, circle that there. I want to add these three numbers right there. So to get my total thermal resistance to this thing. And uh, 0 0.00375, I got two of those, and I'm adding a 1.9. Now I've got a thermal resistance of 1.9075. Uh, we could almost forget about the glass right there. Now that's the R value of my double pane window compared to just 0 0.00375, a whole lot better. And watch what happens right here when I do the... Um, this thing again. I'm going to kind of play a trick right here. See how that K over D is the inverse of what we did for R? R was D over K, right? So I'm going to take this 1.9 and I'm going to slip it in right here. If you wanted to get fancy, I guess you could say Q over T equals A delta T over R. Like that. All right. But uh, check the difference here. My area again was 1.2 meters times 2.3 meters and my temperature difference was 24 degrees Celsius and then down here I've got my total R value which would be 1.9075 and this number is radically different than the first one uh, 1 1.2 times 2.3 times 24 divided by, I'm going to go second answer here and grab that last thing, uh, is 34.7. 34.7 watts or joules per second. I'm only losing 35 joules every second. And back here, what was it? 17,000? That makes a huge difference. So um, I'll tell you a, a true story. 
here. When we moved to Columbia, uh, South Carolina, I don't remember the rest of it, uh, 17,600 something. Um, we bought an old house and um, it had all single pane windows. And that first winter we froze to death and paid out the nose for the for uh heat the thing so first chance i got um i went down to the uh, builder store and i walked in and they had these huge windows and uh that were double pane and i said those look like the huge windows in my old house and i measured them and got real excited because they were the right size somebody had ordered them and then returned them for some reason and they were almost exactly i was missing one or two but i bought like 10 or 12 of these things at like 60 percent off or something windows are really expensive but so is heating your house and i i took them home and traded them all out swapped them out and uh made a huge difference in the in the electrical bill and in the uh the temperature in the house so think about it uh there's a whole industry in trying to um make houses efficient you can go you can get yourself a thermal camera and go around and do this and then write up a report and say, hey, you need to, you know what I'm saying? People made a lot of money at that for a while, probably still could. Um, here's a second way that heat can move, not conduction. That was the energy conducting through the window or through the handle of the pot. Here's convection. I got a little formula for that. I'm not going to say a whole lot about that. It's really similar to the conduction and uh, it's a little more fluid. Uh, uh, the energy per time is equal to HA delta T. H is a factor that, again, kind of depends on the material uh, and how well it flows. Remember, we're not talking about the glass here. That would be conduction. But the heat that's moving upwards because it's uh, hotter, less dense, rising, and then rushing back down. And I'm getting this swirling pattern here, that convection pattern in the liquid itself. You also see conduction up here. See how the air is rising and more air is coming in from underneath? Probably should have gone blue here so you can see that. But uh, that's convection as well. And uh, so the area, the surface area of the, you know, the top of this and the sides of the glass right there is that A that you need. The delta T, you know, I've got... Uh, Maybe my, my water or whatever's in here is at 90 degrees Celsius and the air is at 20 degrees Celsius. So that's that delta T that I need right there. The area is how big the glass is and H is this other factor that you put in. You got a formula for it. All right. Uh, here's the last one. Uh, this is radiation energy by uh, electromagnetic waves. So probably the best example here, you got the sun. The sun shines down on you. And that light, uh, which includes infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, all the stuff that it's spewing out, gets to us. And we go, wow, it's hot today. All right. So here's the formula that uh, runs that. R is the rate of radiation. You could go Q over T again here if you wanted to. Um, same thing. Uh, P is the power that is emitted over some area so this one's a little bit different that uh, I can also I need to talk about how big it is uh, am I just talking about this square inch on my arm or am I talking about my whole torso here and um, obviously I'm going to receive more power over my whole body but if I scale that with the area then it comes out the same E is a number that's called the emissivity and uh, that's kind of a strange number but you have some kind of feel for this. If you have a black car in Columbia, South Carolina, the sun's going to shine on it. And when you open the door, it's going to be about 150 degrees in there. All right. And on the other hand, if you have a white car, then it reflects most of that electromagnetic energy and it doesn't absorb it. So this emissivity is a number that says how much of the energy gets absorbed versus reflected. And uh, it's always between 0 and 1. The emissivity is trapped between 0 and 1. Right here, 0. It's keeping 0%. It's totally reflected. 0% absorbed. And uh, if it's total absorption, that would be 100% or 1 absorbed. 
And we have this term called the black body, thinking about that black car in the parking lot, the, the black asphalt of the parking lot absorbing all that heat, holding it. And um, up here at the top, you also see a picture of a kiln. And if you've ever looked in an old black city kiln, then you know that uh, it's going to absorb all that radiation until you get the thing hot, and then it's going to radiate. So it kind of does both. If it's really hot, it's, it's spewing out energy. Uh, the sun is like that too. Um, it's going to, because it's so hot, it's, it's sending out a whole lot of energy. But if it weren't hot, then it would just be a black thing out in space, and you wouldn't be able to see it against the blackness of space. Here is a nail, and they've got a torch here. They're heating the top of that thing, and you can see that the top is super hot, and you know it's super hot because of the color. And right here, it's not quite as hot because of the color. This, this yellow is a lot hotter than the red there. You can tell the temperature of the kiln by looking at the color. I used to do some blacksmith work, and uh, basically you stick some metal into some burning coal or wood or whatever, uh, propane, some kind of gas forge, and you pull it out a little bit and you look at it and if it's the right color then you know it's the right temperature and it's soft enough to work and so the color is is a big part of that and uh, right there you can see that this is certainly hot enough to beat out and to twist up or do whatever you need to do uh, this is hot enough to to fire pottery and you can look at the color and tell that there's one more thing that you can do with this though and this kind of leads into quantum mechanics, which I'll say just a small word about here. Um, they were doing a lot of this work, firing pottery and stuff, looking at the temperature and the color and trying to correlate that. And uh, they realized that at different temperatures, you can see here this is at 3,000 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin, 5, 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, that's pretty hot stuff. They're actually looking at stars here, and stars are that hot. Um, they're going to put out different... Uh, heat signatures and so um, like our star is about 5,000 degrees Kelvin at the surface and see how the peak of it's right there to yellow so we have a yellow star but a hotter star would be blue over here and uh, if you kept heating this thing it would it would it would go dull red would be hot and this would be hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter it gets hotter as it goes this way and that peak is going to slide and so you can look at the, uh, the spectrum of the light that's coming off and, and tell the temperature, whether it be a star or a nail or what have you. So that's something about radiation there. Um, basically, they're going to give you all the numbers except for one, and you plug them in and, and you solve for it. Okay? So there's not a whole lot to, to say about that. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, have a good day. Hope that made some sense. And uh, we will be back... Uh, next time with something else. Have a good day.